If you're a fan of the fantasy role-playing game genre, you've probably heard of Mana or Mana, the magical power system of magicians and sorcerers. In World of Warcraft, it's the blue bar that slowly drains as you use magical spells. In Super Smash Bros., the character Hero exhausts mana points for every magical spell he casts, kind of like the magical equivalent of a kilowatt. But what is the history of mana, and how did it become a ubiquitous feature in the fantasy game genre? The word mana comes from the Austronesian language family, the indigenous languages of Southeast Asia and the Pacific Island chains. This is a super diverse bunch of languages, so the definition of mana changes somewhat depending on the language. Some cultures use the word in a more general sense of potency, efficacy, or good fortune. For example, on the island of New Caledonia, mana means force, ability, ability, or power. Other branches of this language family link mana with natural forces. In the Vanuatu Islands, east of Australia, it means thunder. Heading over to New Zealand, if you read the Maori Declaration of Independence, a document signed by Maori chiefs in 1835, you'll notice they use the word mana more in the sense of political authority and control. A chieftain has mana. Okay. These are a bunch of dictionary definitions, but what about an example illustrating how this word is used on the ground in oceanic cultures? The best data I could find comes from Fiji, where mana historically functioned as a verb meaning to work successfully. But what's interesting is that Fijians have used the word as a ritualized formula, kind of like amen in Jewish and Christian prayers. For example, Victorian era anthropologists recorded Fijians using the word mana during weddings. When the priest concluded a wedding, he would shout out, Mana. Fijian warriors would also shout out mana in preparation for battle, and a Fijian prayer to the gods for healing a sick person reads, Please be so kind as to cure the sick person. Then they say, Mana, it is true, and then it is true. In all of these examples, mana functions as a ritual utterance that communicates efficacy, completion, or empowerment. This is especially true for that example, the prayer said over a sick person. In this formula, mana almost functions like a magic word that activates the prayer. Mana, it is true, and then it is true. It's ceremonial, ritualized language. And from this example, we can see its relation to supernatural power. But despite this wide range of definitions, wind, thunder, influence, magic, it's that last definition of mana that entered the Western lexicon in 1891 when the English missionary and anthropologist Robert Codrington reported back from his travels in the Solomon Islands. He described it as an omnipresent impersonal power, or even a substance that can attach to people or things, and a force that people, ghosts, or spirits can wield. But as we just saw, mana had a lot of meanings in the languages of the Pacific Islands. Even during his own lifetime, other anthropologists were already criticizing him for making his own superficial generalization of mana, rather than relying on direct interviews with native people. For example, a Maori elder interviewed in the early 20th century couldn't even conceive of mana as a supernatural power at all, but more like personal magnetism or charisma. Nevertheless, Codrington's definition took off, solidifying mana as a noun meaning magical and miraculous power. The anthropologist Edward Tyler described mana as a psychic energy or a type of willpower that enables people to express extraordinary power or wonderworking. Others describe mana as a sort of electricity, talking about war clubs receiving a charge of mana or becoming mana transmitters. Anthropologists like them went through a mana craze in the late 19th century until about the middle of the 20th century. They believed that they not only discovered a primitive form of religion, but they found a universal religious concept embedded in all religion. The Lakota? Well, they call it Wakan. The Haudenosaunee? Well, they call it Orenda. The Vikings? They had mana too. Same with the Greeks and the Romans. Yes, even ancient historians applied the concept of mana to the Greeks and the Romans, saying that Greco-Roman religion is all about the manipulation of mana. Now, this is a dangerous game to play in the study of comparative religion. Taking a very culturally specific concept like mana, and then using your own generalized definition of that concept to try to understand other religions. Sure, all of these cultures had a concept of magic, but focusing on superficial similarities between religions and calling all of it mana 
can lead us to miss the huge differences between these cultures and the different ways they conceptualize magic. By the middle of the 20th century, the mana craze was ending, as scholars became less convinced that it reflected a primitive form of religion, less convinced that it was a universal concept of religion, and less convinced that the prevailing definition of mana was even correct in the first place. Codrington's view of mana as a substance or electrical-like power was more of a European invention than how Austronesian people actually use the term. But even while the concept was starting to lose popularity in scholarly circles, mana found new life in a new arena, pop culture. The science fiction and fantasy writer Larry Niven popularized Mana after publishing his short story, not long before the end. In Niven's literary world, sorcerers draw their powers from a natural energy resource called Mana. But just like fossil fuels, Mana is a finite resource. If magicians spend too much time in one land, they exhaust the land's mana and their magical spells stop working. Niven reports that he first learned about mana as an undergrad reading The Trumpet Shall Sound, a book by the social anthropologist Peter Worsley on Melanesian religion. So, mana found its way into pop culture by way of anthropologists of religion. Niven wasn't the first one to use mana in a fantasy book, but Niven popularized a system for how mana works that proved easy to transpose into the world of gaming as a substance or resource that special practitioners can deplete. Some of the earliest fantasy and role-playing computer games like Ultima 3 and Final Fantasy used MP, or magic points on screen, to track the use of magical spells. But many people were already calling them mana points instead of magic points. Then came Dungeon Master in 1987, a super popular video game which appeared on the Atari, Super Nintendo, PC, and Apple computers. In this RPG game, you had three bars, health, stamina, and mana. This game explicitly references Larry Niven's influence. The Dungeon Master game manual explains that mana can be rejuvenated by drawing new mana from the world around you. This continued into the 1990s in the card game Magic the Gathering, launched in 1993. Magic the Gathering explicitly used Niven's notion of mana, which you can draw from land cards in order to cast spells. The game even included a card called Nevenril's Disc, Larry Niven spelled backwards. This is an object that nullifies the magical power of certain objects and creatures, much like an artifact in Niven's books. And here we are in the 21st century. Mana is now part of the common vocabulary for gamers across the fantasy genre, from World of Warcraft to The Secret of Mana to Magic the Gathering. But we need to remember that indigenous oceanic cultures still exist. People are alive today that use the word mana in daily life, but now in societies that have largely been Christianized over the course of a hundred years. And the concept of mana has also been Christianized. One theologian of the Fijian Methodist Church writes that mana is power or influence, rather than supernatural power. Other Fijian Christian pastors describe God or the Holy Spirit as possessing mana and giving it to Christians. Native Hawaiians also retain a concept of mana in their contemporary culture. In a big sociological study, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs interviewed a bunch of Native Hawaiians, asking them to share their thoughts about mana. Some described it as an essence or energy. Another native Hawaiian described it as an invisible force that you can feel or sense. Although it's difficult to pin down a precise understanding of mana in Hawaiian culture, the author of the study argues that understanding mana is critical to understanding contemporary native Hawaiian identity. To me, this illustrates how far the Western idea of mana has drifted from its origins among the cultures of Oceania. Magicians drinking a blue potion to recharge their mana is a far cry from a native Hawaiian speaking about mana as a personal essence or charisma. But despite this semantic drift, I still see the hints of its various original meanings in oceanic cultures. Power, efficacy, potency, charisma, authority. All of these meanings make sense to describe a special individual imbued with power and efficacy themselves. Even though the fantasy genre currently understands mana as something more concrete, a substance or type of electricity, an echo of the original indigenous meaning of mana remains even a hundred years after the Victorian era. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.